Hey, good morning, church. My name is Clayton. I'm the student pastor here. And being part of the teaching team, I get to come up here every so often and bring God's word to you. And I love doing that. And we are going to continue in our redemption series uh, in the book of Ruth. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Ruth chapter 3. Hey, if you don't have your Bibles, they will be on the screen or on the slide if you're viewing this online. Uh, But first, I'm going to pray and then we'll dive in. Father God, thank you uh, that we are gathered together physically and virtually to to hear the proclamation of your word. Lord, I pray that your word would change us. I pray that your word would stir in our hearts, that we would be changed from the inside out. That we would not walk away, uh, we would not walk away from this thinking to ourselves, I need to do better. But we would go, how do I know you more? Change us, Jesus. Pray that you would think with my mind and my words would be your words. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. That guy is Tony Stark. He, uh, this is the last, this is the, one of the most epic scenes of all time. Judge me later. Okay, we can debate on that at a different time. Uh, this is from the movie Endgame. This is the last movie that we's in. But before we get to this scene, we have to go back to the other movie, Infinity War. Now, I'm just going to nerd out for a second. Just bear with me, okay? So in Infinity War, what happens is the big enemy, Thanos, comes and he wipes out half of the universe so he could live. Tony Stark, in the movie Endgame, sacrifices his life so that everyone else could live. I mean, do you see the massive gospel implications from these movies? Everyone loves a good redemption story, right? But Tony Stark didn't uh, start out really selfless to where he was going to sacrifice himself to save the universe. He didn't do that. If you see the progression of the movies, he starts out very selfish. He actually begins to hurt everyone around him because he is so self-absorbed. But as the movies progress, you see that Tony Stark changes. Well, how does he change? Well, he begins to receive love and kindness in spite of himself from other people. People like his wife, his daughter, and friends around him begin to show him love because he could not muster it up on his own. If you watch the first movie, he tried and just constantly failed. And ultimately what happened is as he received all of these things from uh, from people around him, he began to change. And eventually he gave it all away in this scene. Everything that he had received from other people that he couldn't muster up himself, he gave it all away. And in that moment, not only did Tony Stark seal redemption for himself, but also for everyone else in the universe. He gave them what they could not give themselves, which was salvation. The impending doom was coming. He was the only one that could do it. He's the only one that could save them. Now, in our passage here in Ruth chapter 3, we're going to see something very similar. We're going to see Boaz, he's going to give all that he has received to Ruth. And Ruth is going to be changed, not simply by the things that she does, but because of the love and kindness that she receives to be saved from impending doom. It's quite a dramatic story, so let's dive into Ruth chapter 3. We'll start in verses 1 through 5. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with uh, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. but uh, But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking." But uh, but when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and cover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. So if you remember last week, chapter 2 ends with the harvest beginning. And chapter 3 begins with the harvest ending. So between chapter 2 and 3, months have gone by now. Okay? Months have gone by, and this is months of Ruth building community with other women. This is months of uh, Ruth being around all of these people, working for Boaz, being around Boaz, and doing all of these things. And now it is at the end of harvest, and the end of harvest is a massive celebration. 
Okay? It is a massive celebration of all that God has done of provision, profits, and all the hard work that has taken place for growing the crop and the harvest. And they would do this at the threshing floor. And now the threshing floor is just simply, it was a big barn where the wind would blow through and they would toss up, in this case, barley, the chaff would blow away, and the grain would fall to the ground. Now, my wife's extended family are Kansas farmers, okay? They, it literally, one, by, uh, one mile by one square mile, it's all farmland, okay? And they grow se- uh, different types of crops, but there is no crop like the wheat crop. I mean, ain't no party like a wheat harvest party because the wheat harvest party don't quit. It is a massive celebration for them and their family. And they do the same things. They, they celebrate all of God's provisions that had actually rained. Things grew. They celebrate profits and all the, all the hard work that goes into doing all of that. So here is, is, a, is a little bit of taste uh, of that same thing. And so after a big night of celebration, what would happen, this is the tricky part at the end of the harvest, is people would leave and go back to their respective places because the work is done now. So now everyone scatters. So Naomi now is feeling desperate. She's feeling desperate. So she comes up with a bold proposition for Ruth. She says, hey, after Boaz celebrates for a while... You need to get dressed up. You need to put on some perfume. You need to smell nice. You need to sneak around at night, find out where he's sleeping, uncover his feet, and he's going to tell you what to do. Now, when you first read this, you're like, this is a one-star review for Naomi's advice. Like, this is a terrible scenario for, uh, that Naomi is suggesting. But what I want us to do is put ourselves in Ruth and Naomi's shoes for a moment. We're going to put ourselves in their shoes for a moment. So the harvest is ending, and everyone is going to leave. So the work that she has been doing, her job, is going to be gone. The community that she has built for being a foreigner in Israel is now going to leave. And in this culture, women were typically viewed as property, so there are no rights. You do, uh, women do not have a voice. If something bad were to happen, there's nothing that a woman could do to go to court to defend herself. Ruth is, uh, she's widowed, which in this culture would be essentially damaged goods. Uh, she's poor, she's a foreigner, she's childless, and there's no family heir. And the bright spot is that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. I'll explain more in a second. So this is their one shot to avoid impending doom for their life, to avoid becoming property. This is their one shot. This is it before everyone leaves and goes home. So Naomi has set up a plan for Boaz to redeem Ruth. And Ruth is getting ready to be bold and courageous. And essentially what she is going to do is make a proposal to Boaz. Now, even in our culture, a woman proposing to to the man is unusual. How much more so 3,000 years ago? So as I'm reading and studying scripture, I asked myself a question. What made Ruth and Naomi feel like that they had to take the lead foot on the proposal for Boaz? Like, what was he doing? Because between chapter 2 and 3, months have gone by. In chapter 2, they have lunch together. They're having great conversation. Oh, well, months go by. Community is being built. He had plenty of opportunity to say something like, hey, I think I like you at any point in time. But none of that took place. And I think there's two actually really good reasons why Boaz uh, stayed put. One is that Boaz was, is an older man. And Naomi, or excuse me, Ruth is a younger woman, and he assumed that she would go after the younger men. You'll see that in verse 10. Um, another reason is that Boaz is a man of great character, and he knew his place. He knew his place. Uh, there is a kinsman redeemer that is closer in relation to them than he is. It was actually another man's responsibility to redeem Ruth. It was not his responsibility. He knew his place. He is a godly man. He knew the Bible. So he stayed put for a little while. So now here we have this desperation. We have a bold proposition of of Ruth. 
Think about this scenario. She's, uh, she has no money. She's from a foreign land that does not know the culture. She is a Moabite enemy of God. Uh, she is childless. She is getting ready to go ask a wealthy business owner, Israelite, who is a different race than her, to ask, hey, will you marry me? Now, my guess is if you're Ruth, you do not put this uh, as your resume on your dating app, right? Um, I have no money. I used to worship false gods, and I live with my mother-in-law. I am clearly a catch. Please, yet yeah, email me. Nope, that's prob. Do, do, do you feel the desperation from them? The odds of anything good happening are extremely low. But the story doesn't stop there. So what happens next? Well, let's read in 6 through 10. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I, this is wildly important. I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, don't read ahead, okay? Don't read. If you have your Bibles, don't read ahead. Anticipation is the spice of life. Just roll with it. We'll finish what he says in a second, okay? So here she executes the plan, right? She gets dressed up. She puts on Obsession by Dior, and she sneaks around. She gets on her ninja skills. She sneaks around at midnight and finds out where he's sleeping, uncovers his feet, and in a hilarious uh, exchange in verse 8, uh, the Bible reads, Behold, which I think we should just start saying uh, normally, is just when you see someone, behold, that's how we're going to uh, start welcoming you when you come to church. Behold, the Meltons, and we're just going to like an announce you, okay? Um, so, behold, a woman lay at his feet. Modern day translation, a girl. Like, he just gets really freaked out that this, there's a person at midnight uncovering his feet. Now, this is actually really significant, what is happening here. Because all throughout Scripture, any time someone is being placed at the feet of someone, this is an act of humility and vulnerability. Uh, most notably, we see this in Scripture in John chapter 13, when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Now, this act was for the lowest of low in society. Okay, these are nasty, dirty feet. And it, and, and it was the lowest of the low. What Jesus is doing in, in those moments and washing the disciples' feet is he's uh, coming with an act of humility and vulnerability to the disciples. This is the exact same thing that Ruth is doing. This is very humble. This is very vulnerable. And what she says in verse 9 is, is interesting. She says, spread your wings over your servant. And this is the same phrase in the original language Hebrew that Boaz uses in chapter 2 to bless Ruth. He says in chapter 2, the Lord under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So what is Ruth saying? Ruth is saying, listen, you bless me. Now, she's, in chapter 2, several months ago, what happened is Boaz said, the Lord is going to bless you and take refuge. Ruth shows up and says, the Lord use you to bless me. Okay, so what she is doing here is she's being bold and courageous and assertive and humble and vulnerable. And yes, you can be all of these things at the exact same time. Now, gentlemen, I don't know if you're like me, uh, because this is very emotionally complex. I don't know if you're a lot like me, but sometimes I have the emotional depth of a teaspoon. And so when I read things like this, I'm like a robot and I just like sh sort of shut down. I, I cannot comprehend all of those things at the exact same time. Okay, What she is doing is very emotionally complex. But to keep you in, suspen uh, in suspense and anticipation for what Boaz is getting ready to say... We need to understand the levels of communication that are going on here. And now, I want you to stick with me because this could absolutely change how you communicate with people. It could change the way that, that you do it. And it will fully explain the response of Boaz. 
there was a professor at Biola University who came up with the five levels of communication. The first one is cliché. Uh, this is you're communicating, but you're not really saying anything. This is good morning, good morning, how are you? I'm good, you're good, uh, we're all good. Okay, your, your, your words are coming out of your mouth, but you're not really saying anything. Uh, the second one is facts. This is uh, sharing what I know. Okay, so, for example, the Chiefs won this last Super Bowl. That is a fact that I know that I am sharing with you. Okay? The third one is opinions. This is sharing with you what I think. Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. And often what I will do is use number two to support number three, that Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. Okay? Don't, we can debate this later. This is, now is not the time. Okay? And now number four and five are indicator lights of deep relationship. Uh, number four is emotive. This is sharing how I feel. This is empathy, love, affection, sorrow, lament. It's all of those things. You're sharing how you feel. Number five is transparency. Sharing who I am. Now, after being married for nearly 10 years... I think I'm just now starting to learn that if my wife begins to communicate with, uh, with me at level four and I come at her with level two communication, how well do you think that's going to work? Now, if you've been married for more than 34 seconds, you know that this is not going to go very well. When she says, this is how I'm feeling, and I go, well, technically, it's not going to go very well, okay? There's going to be an argument Surely to ensue. Now, what happens when I do that? What happens when I communicate like that? When I am, uh, if I bypass level four of lament and joy and affection to communicate level two, what happens is I, listen, I miss the person entirely. I miss them. And if I'm honest, my tendency leans toward two and three. I'm going to share with you my opinion, and I'm going to have a bunch of facts to support my correct opinion. And I'm going to post about it on social media. That's my tendency is to do two and three. And I'm going to ruin relationships by doing so. Now, we know that facts are important, right? We know that they are. And listen, so are the timing of those facts. Let me give you an example um, I have a family member who is in prison. Uh, they're going to be there for a long time. Is it helpful for me to build relationship with him by bringing up his crimes? And when I go visit him in prison, do I go, hey, uh, these are the things that you did. Do you remember? <laughs> is that helpful to build relationship? Of course not. But facts are important. And you know who presented those facts? The judge. Because that's the judge's job. That's what he does for a living. During the trial, during the hearing, the judge presented the facts. That was at the right time. The facts were needed for the conviction, and the judge was right. That needed to take place. Well, what's helpful for me to build relationship with him is for me to show up and, and go and to show him love and grace and actually listen and grieve with him as he repents not present the facts. There's a saying that goes, uh, being listened to is so close to being loved that it is hard to tell the difference. Oh, that we would be a group of people who would love well, who would stop and listen. Now, this communication scale, some of it explains the, the massive racial tensions that we're experiencing. Some of it explains the, uh, the discontent and, and, and the conflict in your relationships now. Friendships, parents, kids, the list goes on and on. It explains some of those things. So, now back into the text. Knowing the communication scale and knowing what we know about the character of Boaz, how do you think that Boaz is going to respond to Ruth's level four and five communication? Because she comes to him at level five saying, Ruth, 
I, I am Ruth, your servant. This is who I am. And, she, and she's also coming to him with a, a lot of emotions, right? There, there's boldness. She's assertive. She's humble. She's vulnerable. How do you think Boaz is going to respond? Now the anticipation is over. Let's read verses 10 and 11. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after younger men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For my fellow townsmen know, listen, that you are a worthy woman. So Boaz responds with blessing. The lead foot of Boaz this whole entire time has been empathy and kindness and grace because that's exactly what he's received from the Lord. He's a man of the word. He knows knows the God of the Bible. And now listen, Boaz could have responded any number of ways that would have resulted in the destruction of Naomi and Ruth, right? He could have responded in any number of negative ways because, listen, no matter what Boaz said, if it was negative, he would have been believed. Because, remember, women are typically viewed as property. They have no voice, and no matter what Boaz says, she couldn't have defended herself in any sort of court situation. She would have been unable. And then for Naomi and Ruth, if that would have gone poorly, you move again. You move to a place potentially you don't even know to start your life over again. Imagine the situation. Her life is literally riding on his response and his reaction. And Boaz responds with grace and kindness, and it changes everything. Now, he does say that he is going to be a redeemer, and I want you to notice something What did he call her? He called her a worthy woman. This is the same phrase in the original language, worthy woman, that is used in Proverbs 31 of the virtuous woman. And now as I'm reading and studying this text, I think to myself, wait a minute. A worthy woman? If you've been with us in chapter 1, my question is, or my statement was, She's not. I mean, we could go to her past. She's not. She, uh, she is widowed, presumed damaged goods uh, in, in, in that culture. Uh, she's childless. And in the ancient world, if you could not have children, you were presumed cursed by God. She is a Moabite woman, an enemy of God. She used to worship false gods doing horrific things. But God. But God changed Ruth's identity back in the middle of chapter 1. There was a covenant made when, when she goes, my God will be your God. Ruth's identity was completely changed forever. And she could have played the victim, couldn't she? She could have played the victim in going to Boaz and said, oh, I can't. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a foreigner. I'm a different race. I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm an enemy of God. I'm childless. And the list goes on and on. But when she was changed from the inside out, When she's changed from the inside out, the new showed up. She received new identity, new life, and the old was gone. And one of the most impressive things about this whole thing is that Boaz knows her past. And he chooses to celebrate her new life, not her old life. Now, when when he calls Ruth a worthy woman, Boaz is not letting Ruth look in the rearview mirror of her life. Because, listen, she ain't going that way. She's not going that way. Everything is different. And some of you in here and some of you watching online may feel like uh, you're, you're a little bit of Ruth, that I wish your whole past is full of I wish I wouldn't have or I wish I should not have. And what we need is a Boaz named Jesus to show up and give more grace than you have sin. And it changes everything. See, Boaz treats her Like she's actually and literally made in the image and likeness of God. She's part of the Imago Dei, even though Ruth is different from him in nearly every single way. Every way. 
It's because he's been changed from the inside out. Do you see it? He is giving what he has already received from the Lord. Dr. Brian Loritz would say it this way. We can't be vertically good with our Heavenly Father if we're not horizontally good with the ones he created. Transformation happens from the inside out. If our hands are an extension of our hearts, then our hearts must be dealt with for our hands to change. See, this is why Ruth can be courageous and vulnerable. This is why Boaz can be tough and tender. Do you see biblical manhood and womanhood playing out here? Culture's got it wrong. The Bible shows up and gives us a different narrative of how it all operates. But the story doesn't stop there. Read with me in verses 12 through 18. And now it is true, this is Boaz speaking, and now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he, will not, if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the thre- threshing floor. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her, and she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matters turn out, for the man will not rest, uh, will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So this is Boaz. He snuck her out uh, just before dawn to protect her reputation. So not only do we see Boaz as a protector, but he is also very generous. He gives her even six measures of barley to take back home with her. Because Boaz knows, just like the God of the Bible, that generosity brings life. Boaz is a life giver. He doesn't take. He's, he's a life giver to people. And he says that he is going to do everything in his power to be the redeemer for Ruth. Now, what does it mean to be a redeemer? If you want to uh, study this more and look at all of the laws pertaining what it means to be a redeemer, you can look at Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 25. That's Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 25 to look at all of the laws pertaining to what it means to be a redeemer. Now, the reason God established these laws for people to be a redeemer is because God wanted to protect the most vulnerable among Israel, like Ruth and Naomi, to keep them from going into poverty, slavery, or God forbid, even something worse. God established these laws to to protect the marginalized, okay? And now typically a redeemer would be someone who is a, a very close relative. Boaz is not that. He's far more of a distant relative. And so it was another man's responsibility to, to redeem Ruth. So what is Boaz doing here? Well, he is going above and beyond what the law requires to reconcile and to redeem Ruth. He's going to do everything in his power to make something that's not his responsibility his own responsibility. Now, the low-hanging fruit of application here is this, is, hey, you should be like Boaz if there's any sort of redemption or reconciliation that needs to take place in your relationships, your spouse, your kids, your parents, your friends, you should do that. But listen... I just can't stop there, can I? Because morality doesn't save. Being like Boaz does not make you right with Jesus. It doesn't. Morality has an inability to save anyone. So we have to take a step back and go, why did Boaz do all of those things? The simple way to put it and to summarize it is Boaz can only give what he has received. From the Lord. He's been changed from the inside out. And and he is constantly giving grace, kindness, and forgiveness to Ruth. And we know the reason you do this is because you've already received those things. 
You've received that from the Lord. And the best picture of the gospel in Ruth chapter 3 is Boaz going above and beyond the law, uh, uh, beyond what the law requires to take on a responsibility that is not his own. And Ruth comes with a lot of baggage, right? She comes with a lot of baggage. And friends, this is exactly what Jesus does with us. That we are Ruth in a helpless position and we need a Boaz named Jesus to come down out of heaven, to go to a cross, to die for our sins, to save us from impending doom. And even if it, and even it wasn't his responsibility... Jesus had every right to stay in heaven, to stay on the throne, but he didn't. He chose to make something his responsibility that wasn't his. We were supposed to deal with our own sin. Jesus said, I will do that. I will do that. And we often come to Jesus with a lot of baggage, right? For some of us, it's just a backpack that's full of lead. We can wear it. It's kind of heavy. Others of us, we have a whole lot of carry-on luggage. Okay, that airplane is going to be an expensive airplane because we have to pay for so much luggage. And don't that beeping noise in the background, don't mind the dump truck full of my stuff. We can get to that at a different time, okay? Listen, Jesus is the only one that can bury the burden of your sin. He's the only one. For some of us, we've been carrying it for far too long. So we, like Ruth, go to the feet of the Redeemer, to do what only he can do, for us to receive love, grace, and forgiveness. And listen, there's so much more to this story. You're going to want to tune in next week or come back next week because there's so much in chapter 4 that we haven't yet covered. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for being the Redeemer. Thank you for doing what you can do. Only you can do. Thank you, Jesus, for laying down your rights. Jesus, I confess that I love my rights and you laid down your rights and you made us your responsibility. You made my sin your responsibility, Jesus. You went to the cross and you buried the burden of my sin. Jesus, thank you for being a greater Boaz who is generous and kind and empathetic. May we receive those things from you so we can change the world by giving it to other people. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. And it's in your precious name. Amen.